Good morning again. If you would with me, please turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. I'll be reading the first 13 verses. Now, if you're not sure in your Bible where it's at, 2 Peter comes right after 1 Peter. There you go. I'm trying to help you out. Now, if you go into the first couple chapters, you're going to read some things about the coming of the Lord. And I think most of us understand it. I'm going to touch on a few things before I start to read here. That with the coming of the Lord, this is the same Jesus that walked the earth. This is the same one that, that, that they beat, that they lied on, that they crucified without cause. Same guy. This is the same guy that was, was born in a manger. That, that was wrapped in swaddling clothes that the angels hovered over. Same guy. But when he comes back, he's not the same guy. So he done what he'd done for us. All the walk that he walked while he was here, it was for us. Everything that he'd done, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, show it to you in his book, making intercession for us. That's for us. She's coming back as a judge. Now, I don't wrap him in swaddling clothes anymore. You are definitely not going to drive any nails in his hands and his feet. He's coming back as the ruler of all things. Amen. Now, he always was, but he had walked through what he walked with for us. But here the apostle begins to write. 2 Peter chapter 3. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. How many of you have ever done that? I'll make fun of my wife. She forgot to put the eggs in the oven. <laughs> the oven was on. <laughs> the eggs weren't in it. So what do we have to do sometimes? We stir it up by way of remembrance. <laughs> she was tired. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that was then being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, for not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye ought be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, I think most of us should know that section of scripture. It gets taught and preached on quite a bit. A lot of people have their opinions on when this is going to happen and that's going to happen. My opinion is very easy. I, I know four basic teachings on the coming of the Lord, on timing, on this, on that. Guess what? Been schooled in all of those. I pick one out more than the other. The, the answer to it all is you better be ready when he gets here. Amen. I can sit and argue with you and I can show you scriptures. I can tear it apart, put it back together. We can go back in original languages and drag out all kinds of books. And if you're not ready, it don't matter. 
you're not ready, it don't matter. It doesn't matter. Now, my wife and I have both touched on, on something a little bit already in service today. The yesterday, yesterday there was a weather warning. The radio went beep, the TV went beep, everything went beep. How many of you love that? Right in the middle of your favorite show. Beep. <laughs> and you're trying to read the lips on the person talking because you, you don't want to miss your favorite show. We don't think much of those warnings and we don't pay a lot of heed to them. We were out in that. When I say raining sideways, I mean flat out sideways. You couldn't see the road, you couldn't see anything. I'm pulling a trailer behind my truck and I had some things ratchet strapped down and I was looking in my mirror and a grill I had just bought went sideways out from underneath the ratchet straps and picked it straight up over a six foot tailgate and threw it right in the middle of the road. So I pulled off the side and like my wife said, God had blessed us, there was no traffic, there was nothing. I'm on a road that's 55 miles an hour I had nowhere to pull over, I'm blocking the lane, and I put on my emergency flashers. I didn't want somebody else hitting it, tearing up their car, so I'm trying to pick up pieces and parts, I'm trying to get it all, and all of a sudden, here come people, and not just people, people that were willing to help me. Now this isn't a sunshiny day with Robin singing. This is ugly out here, this is blowing sideways, and out of all of the people in the world, the guy that jumps out and goes to give me a hand, Looks like I did when I was 18. <laughs> and I thought, hey, mackerel, what have I got here? And so nice, so polite, so healthy. And I so wanted like, to hug this guy and, and help him back to his car, but it was pouring rain and both of us were soaking. <laughs> we just had to get going and get out of traffic, get things moving. But, but all of that, but see, all I had to do all I had to do, listen real close, was heed the warning. It wasn't life or death that I hauled that that day. Could have went back the next day and picked it up. Bought and paid for it, didn't go anywhere. I really couldn't use it that day. <laughs> there was no reason, and so I said and I thought, and you can blame whatever you want to blame, and you can think about whatever you want to think about. I didn't have to do it. And there was a warning. <laughs> On Friday afternoon, May 31st, in 1889, a man named Daniel Payton came running into this town, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. He was riding a horse. And he was screaming to the top of his lungs that the dam had burst. His horse was in the lather. Some even said as he rode across the cobblestone that, that the shoes on the horse were throwing sparks and he's yelling that the dam had burst. Well, you know what had happened in that city? You guys know, know the, the old parable of the young boy crying wolf. Well, everybody had talked about it for so many years that the dam looked shaky, that you know one day it might break, and it had been a conversation for so long that when he come riding through town, very few people heeded what he had to say. Now, a few of them that knew him and knew that he was serious Horse and buggy headed up to high ground. They headed to the mountains. They, they rode for all they had and got out of the way. There was a whole lot of that town that didn't make it because they didn't need the warning. Now, all I lost was a grill. A lot of people lost their lives. There's warnings going out all the time that Jesus is coming. Has been for 2,000 years, Jesus is coming. From the day he left, he was coming back. And I'm not going to be fool enough to stand up here and tell you that I think this day or that day is that day. I'm going to let you in on a secret. Every sign that I know of, and I study it very vehemently, is coming together very quickly. And if there's any time to walk with the Lord, now's the time to do it. What does that song say? The devil might be trying to take me out of this church, but he ain't taking the church out of me. This is a time to fight. This is a time to stand your ground. This is just time to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. How many of you, if you live long enough, you remember the old song, Signs? 
Signs, signs everywhere, signs blocking up the scenery, breaking my mind. Do this, don't do that. Can't you read the sign? Well, if you're not old enough and you don't remember the song, you won't get the joke. But out in front of a gas station, there was a gas station a store, restaurant kind of thing. You guys know what I'm talking about. And this is sort of rural. It's out of the way. And it had a sign out front. It said, times are hard. Long-haired, freaky people can't apply. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you haven't lived long enough, I'm sure a thousand people drove by that sign and thought, what does that mean? <laughs> you have to live long enough to know the song. But here's the warnings. And here's the signs. Here's the things. Everybody thought that it was a joke until a 15-foot wall of water came ripping down through town and hundreds of people were swept out. Hundreds. Because they didn't need a warning. Like I say, all I lost was a girl. Warnings are a funny thing. I've said before, I live right down the road from a fire station. I sleep right through that side right now. And before, I could hear the firemen close their car doors. So what happens? Get used to it. Don't ever get used to the term, the sentence that Jesus is coming. Don't ever let that become that siren that, that just isn't there anymore. Well, pastor, don't you know that, that your father said that and your grandfather said that? Don't you know that for generations that, that we've all walked along and we've always heard it? Did anybody just listen to what I just read? And, and nothing's changed since creation. That's one of the signs of the times. Where do you get that we've always had wars, there's always somebody fighting with somebody. We've always had hunger, there's always somebody somewhere that's hungry. We've always had, we've always had. We haven't always had them all together. And here they are, and we're looking into something that the world is afraid to say. That as much as we think we are so smart and we're going to figure it all out and everything's going to come together in such a nice and wonderful way, we're going to be in a place of history very shortly that we're not going to be able to figure out. And the only answer you've got is Jesus, and you better know him. Amen. Oh, seriously, how full do you think this place right here will be the day after the rapture happens? People that have said they've been members of Wayland Community Church, I've been here 10 years and I've never met them. They'll show up. They'll show up. Prayerfully, hopefully, walking with the Lord. I'm not here to preach to you. Yon, yon. But now millions of people, they get saved by warnings every year. They get saved by warnings every year. If you're headed down a road and there's a big sign that says bridge out, what do you do? Stop. <laughs> I didn't hear the right answer. The answer is stop. Don't keep driving. You know, they may have fixed it. <laughs> Who's that guy back there thinks he's going to tell me what to do? I love people with attitude. <laughs> there is a gentleman that, that's on the internet and he makes a living out of going from lake and river and place to place and he finds cars. And a lot of them have been missing for years. He solved a whole lot of crimes in his job. A lot of the cars that he pulls out has bodies in them. People ended up missing and, and nobody know where they went, whatever else, and they went off the edge of a bridge. They went here, they went here. And, and some of them, 20 year old crimes. And he solves a crime and that, that's what he does. I don't want anybody to come looking for me. How about you? 20 years from now, hey, hey look, that dumb preacher never read design. <laughs> or he read it and didn't pay any attention to it. That'd probably be more like it. I wonder how many people read their medicine bottles. How many of you take medications? Now, I've been taking, a lot of mine have to do with heart issues, so I've been taking mine long enough that guess what, when I get it, I already know what it says on it. I don't have to read it. I know how many a day I'm supposed to take. I know how this. I know how that. Guess what happened to me not too long ago? Got the bottle and looked. Instead of it saying on the side 10 milligrams, it said 30. Ew. Huh. Wonder if that might have bothered me. I started taking those. One a day every day. And all of a sudden it says 30 instead of 10. 
Every now and again, it's good to reread that, what you think you know. And here's this book, and a lot of us think we know it. And we've been through it how many times, and we can quote verses, and we can tell you where stories is at, and we can go to books, and I want to let you in on a secret. we got more translations now than we've ever had since the world began, but I think we need to reread it instead of rewrite it. I think we need to get our face in this book. I think we need to know what the truth of the Word of God says. So, well, you know, so-and-so went to this school and so-and-so went to that school. That's all good and well. But it doesn't matter if you don't read it. It doesn't matter if you don't read it. Adam and Eve got a warning. Can you imagine? Think about it. Here's this garden. I don't know how big it was. It's a pretty sized place. And you've got everything planted here. You don't even have to. I mean, how many of you like to garden? Gardening is one of my favorite things. All but the weeds. Guess what wants to come up faster than the beans? So what do I do? I go out there, and i got all kinds of implements and what have you. And at my age, I, I sort of put the hoe away, and I bought me a little two-cycle rototiller. It does a way better job and doesn't hurt my shoulders and hands near as bad. And so what do we do? We, we have to tend it. But here's a garden that didn't even need tending at the time. And, and all of the things that God had blessed them with. And he told them one thing. I have people tell me, well, you know, the Ten Commandments. No, well, the man failed when he only had one commandment. Don't eat that. Eat anything else you want. Don't eat that. I used to tease my boys when they were little. Their mother would cook something new. Dad, Dad, how is it? Of course, I'd take a couple of bites. I'd say, it's terrible. You guys don't want none of this. Get out of my way. And they would dive in their head first because they knew me. <laughs> Dad's trying to keep it for himself. I knew how to get little boys to eat their food. All I have to do is say, no, it's no good. Get out of the way. I'll eat it. But the idea is they had, they had one morning. And when you don't eat it, what happens? Adam, where are you? Lord, I hid myself. Why would you hide yourself? Because I was naked. Who told you you was naked? Who told you that? Do you have knowledge that you're not supposed to have? You've done something and you need to talk to me. And you know what usually happens, and it's in the world all over the place, it's not just in northeastern Ohio, is people make mistakes. Guess what? That's a worldwide problem. And when most people make mistakes, you know what they do? They run from God instead of to Him. Adam and Eve done the same thing. They went and hid. God had to go get them. Hey, I called you for a purpose. Get out here. We don't need to be running from God when we make mistakes. We need to be running to Him. And as people of God, they, they don't need this snake behind them going, ooh, look what you did. They need somebody saying, guess what? I've made my mistakes too and I made it. You'll make it too. Let's follow Jesus together. How many people you know ever, ever saw a commercial or anything else that says, don't drink and drive? <laughs> many years ago, I had a guy come in on a job and he'd gotten a DWI and seen him in a couple days and he was in jail and they let him out. He's awaiting his trial, going to go through all that. And the first thing out of his mouth was that no good cop. <laughs> I said, stop right there. Well, what do you mean? I said, my sons are out there driving. They weren't married yet. I said, but they're all number. I got two children out there driving. I got a wife out there driving. And I said, you're going to get all drunk up and go left to center and kill one of my family? Thank God for that officer. He never mentioned it to me again. <laughs> oh, man, it was so bad. But what happened to me? I was just down the road from my house. I wasn't that far. And we know the warnings, yet we don't heed them. How many of you have bought a pack of cigarettes in the last so many years? You ever read the side of that thing? Yeah, we go ahead and do whatever we want to do because we do it. We don't take warnings very well. I'm a full grown adult. I can do anything I want to do. Well, go ahead. I had a lady on oxygen. She's passed away now for many years. I said, Pastor, why did God do this to me? She's on oxygen, couldn't hardly breathe, struggled, couldn't hardly get around. And she was a 50-year smoker, and she blamed God. 
I don't think God had anything to do with that. But there it is. So we don't, we don't deal with warnings well. We get warnings from the government. Sunday school class this morning. What happens if you don't pay your taxes? Yeah. One of my cousins called me many years ago, and I paid my house off, and he said, called me to congratulate me. I don't even know how he found out. But he, was, he lived in another state. He called me. He says, that is so cool. He said, you're one of the few ones in the family. He said, you own all your stuff? He said, how does it feel to own all your stuff? I said, you think I own it? Don't pay your taxes. See who owns it. Mm -hmm. He got quiet. He said, I never thought of that. That's all we do. We rent it from the government. That's all we do. We rent it from the government. You, you may have the bank pay off, but yeah, you're not free. <clears throat> We're not free. So the government will warn you. They'll send you a letter. Somebody may even come by. They may even knock on the door. And they say, uh, you know, you need to this, you need to that. And it won't take too long. They'll put a padlock on it. And somebody else will buy it in an auction. But guess what happens when they buy it? they got to pay the taxes on it. So nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. You would think men would learn from the folly of other men. It is so much easier. I, I have, I've studied, I've read, I've prayed, I've been through. It is so much easier sometimes if you sit down, and, and I, I think you need to emulate Christ. Don't much under, misunderstand me. But if you know a good Christian that's doing it right and walking with the Lord, it's not a bad idea every now and again to sit down and look and say, I wonder what they're doing that they're getting this right. Now behind them, you're going to find a prayer life. Behind them, you're going to find reading study of the Word. Behind them, you're going to find a whole lot of things that you don't see out front. You're going to find that if you look at their life. You're going to find what you need. Now you may be called to a different calling. You may be walking in a different walk. But they're going to have the basics that you're going to need if you want to do this. Now, now you would think that, that we would all do this. <coughs> Anybody know anything about Napoleon? About what? Napoleon. Oh. Wait a minute. <laughs> okay, now, okay, Napoleon. Now, anybody know anything about Napoleon? Now, what did he do? He, he, he uh, overextended himself, thought he was more than he was. <coughs> And he ended up going down to try to deal with Russia in the middle of the winter. And he wasn't geared for the winter. And the winter ate him. The Russians didn't eat him. Nothing else ate him. But yet, it snows every year, doesn't it? Yeah. It's not like it snuck up on him. He understood what he was doing and where he was going. Do, do most of us know our times and seasons? Okay, it's the wet season right now. We call it spring and, and we're getting out there in the mud, sticking seeds in the ground and having a good time. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to have summer. We're going to watch everything start to come up. We're going to pray every now and again that it does rain. <laughs> I don't want to have to get out this thing's too big. I don't want to get out and have to start trying to water this. Then we're going to go into fall. I love fall. And the leaves are going to change. And I'm going to set my tree stand. I'm going to try to be real quiet. I'm going to look around. And then winter's coming again. <clears throat> and I want to say, now, Lord, I know why most of the old people are in Florida. <laughs> but it happens every year. And we live in a state and in a place where the seasons, the seasons come, and, and sometimes rather abruptly, and, and we're, we live in seasons. So we know what to expect. But here Napoleon goes down when he knows winter's coming, and he goes to fight a battle, and the winter beat him. Now, do you think we would learn anything from that? Let's go from the time of Napoleon to a guy named Hitler. Now, Hitler thought he was more than he was. Stretched himself out too thin and decided to go down and make war with Russia in the winter. And what happened to him? It's one of his greatest downfalls. It was the beginning of all of his downfall. And yet, had he read his history, he would have found out Napoleon done the exact same thing and failed. Why would you think if you're going to do the exact same thing that you would not fail? And yet, even in our own personal lives, as we walk before the Lord, sometimes everything doesn't work out exactly the way that we want it to. But because it's the way we want it, we're going to keep trying it until we get it. And we keep failing. We wonder why. Warnings. And we've got to heed them. 
If you're walking in your life and it's not working out, there's a place in life where it's really good to get down and say, Heavenly Father, I'm beyond myself. I need you. Father, I'm giving you permission to interfere in my life. Father, not my will, but thine be done. Heed the warning. And you'll watch how your life will turn around. I could bore you to death with testimony said in a 24-hour period, 24 hours, my life turned around in such a way you would not believe what God done for me. And I prayed one prayer. And it was, Father, I place this in your hands because it's beyond me. I can't do this. And I watched what God done in 24 hours. In 24 hours, my life turned around because I was willing to say, this is beyond me. Oh, I was a young guy then and, and thought I was smart and worked two jobs. Paid all my bills, done everything I could, was going to school at night, had no idea when I slept. Honestly, I can look back, I have no idea how I lived through it. And everything was falling apart, completely coming apart in my life. And I was striving so hard to be the good husband, to be the good father, to be a good Christian, to walk with God in every area of my life. And, and I was losing in every area of my life. And I was not the man that I should have been. And it was coming apart of me. And one day I said, Heavenly Father, this is beyond me. I give it to you. Tell me what to do. And in 24 hours, you would not believe the changes that began to take place in my life. So there is a place where, where you may think you know, where you may work and struggle, and I thank God for workers. I don't believe in lazy Christians. How's that? That book right there says, if a man does not work, neither should he eat. How plain is that? So I love men that work. I love to see people that go and that do and that strive. But sometimes in every bit of our efforts, it's just not going to come around right. Hey, Lord, what would you have me do? What would you have me do? Hard work doesn't always get it. And I, I'm a guy. I was raised with a good work ethic. I, I look at both of my sons, and sometimes I wish I hadn't put such a good work ethic in them. I wasn't just working herself to death just like I did. But I believe in a good work ethic. I think we should strive. I think we should do everything we can do. But realize when you get to the end of you, there is where God will meet. That's where God will meet you. Noah wasn't a perfect guy. I can show you all kinds of bad things about Noah. What gives Noah such a big story in the book? When God spoke, he listened. He heeded the warning. <clears throat> what would have happened if he'd have said, ah, boys, don't worry about it. We're not going to work today. We can, we can take a couple weeks off. Everything will be fine. And two weeks before you got the boat done, it starts to rain. <laughs> ah! What happens? Eight other people get wet. That's what happens. So what made him different than all the other people? He wasn't a perfect man. He had his faults. He had his problems. He listened and obeyed God. He listened and obeyed God. If you start looking around for a perfect person, will God help you? There isn't enough excedrin out there to get rid of that headache. Go ahead and start staring at people and start looking for the perfect person. Go ahead. Go ahead. I found a few people in my life that, that come pretty close. I found some great people in my life. Not everybody's evil, not everybody's mean. There's some good and godly people out there. But if you want to pick deep enough, you're going to find a fault. You're going to find something you don't agree with. You're going to find, guess what? Uh, Jesus is still Lord of all. What do you think of that? Amen. So here's Noah. Now Noah's going to deal with this. And he's going to do what the Lord said. Now I don't know if they had that saying back then or not. But, but yeah, if Noah hadn't had done it, we's all up the creek without a paddle. How's that? <laughs> we's all up the creek without a paddle. Now I don't know. They got that one built down on the Ohio River. You go down and look at the ark. I don't know if it was near that pretty. I don't know if it was varnished and sanded. I, 
There's a thousand things I don't know about it. I know this, it would float. And when you got rain coming down and up, you better be in something that floats. Now, whether you talk about Noah's Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of Satan, which is Jesus Christ, when this world starts coming apart, you better have an ark. That's not even in my notes. How can you think of that? So what does the Word of God say to those that aren't walking with Him? It, it doesn't say, I hate you. It doesn't say, depart from me. It doesn't say... That, that, you know, that too many people want to take the word of God and, and like a baseball bat and go beating on folks. Let me tell you what. It says, repent. Come unto me and I will save you. It says, I love you. It says, I love you. Now, I watched as the 80s hit. I think most of you remember the 80s. It's not a bunch of you guys remember the 50s. <laughs> but I remember the 80s. And I remember when the 80s hit, uh, so much of the ministry got behind the pulpit and all they preached was the love of God. Now I believe God is love. It says so in the book. Uh, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. I'll give you a bunch of love scriptures. But He's also a judge of all. And we can't get lost in the love message and lose the judge message. We, we just can't. Because when we do, we've made an idol. We're not letting Him be God. For stripping him of a part of who he is, of what he is. Now the judgment part, see that judge thing, when I was a walk with the Lord, they used to scare me to death. Guess what? I'm tickled to death about it now because I learned about the blood of Jesus. A judge part does not scare me any bit whatsoever because I know where I stand with him. And I know what he's going to say to me. And it's not because of me. It's not because of how smart you are, degrees on the wall, or anything else you got. It's about the blood of Jesus. We better get that part. And we better be in the ark of safety. So what does the scripture say? It says, return to God, and, and you draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to you. Turn from your wicked ways, put your trust in him, and walk with him. And he'll make something new out of you. I said that this morning, one of, one of my first verses I ever bothered to try to learn. As a babe in Christ, I stumbled, I staggered, I, I honestly, the things I went through, completely unnecessarily. How many of you got a past? How many of you got a few things you wish to God your brain was like a computer and you could hit the delete button? Yes. There's a bunch of junk up there. You know what? I would be smarter if I could get rid of all the junk that I don't want. <laughs> There'd be more room up there for stuff. So what did the devil like to do with me all the time? Oh, you're going to witness to that person. You know what you did. You know where you've been. You know what you said. You know, you know, you know. You know what I found out? I knew that I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's what I found out. That all things had passed away. All things had become new. And there was nothing he could hold against me that I had put under the blood. Not thing one. So I learned to do a few things. Now, I don't even talk to the devil anymore. But when he would try to play in my head, I'd say, well, you want to discuss my past? How about we discuss your future? You know, he's got a future. Show it to you in a book. Oh, there's a sect of Protestantism out there want to teach universal reconciliation. Everything comes back again unto God. Even the devil's going to get to go to heaven. Well, that's not in this book. How's that? And there is a place prepared for him, and he shall be sealed for an eternity. And he'll be out of our hair. How would you like to be in a world where there wasn't no devil? No demons, no sin. Well, that's where I'm at it, folks. And if you think it sounds like a good idea, go with me. So what am I talking about now? I'm talking about warnings. Now, what happens when you give a warning is a lot of people will despise you. One of the first messages I ever preached like this, I was a young minister, and a lot of people didn't like it. Well, you know what? If you don't like it this morning, that means at least you were listening. How's that? And I'm a way different guy when I was a young preacher, because right now, if I can aggravate you, that means I'm touching something in you. Thank God. Oh, and how many of you got a funny one? How many of you know when you hit it, it's not funny? Why did they call it that? 
Well, you know what? You should have a spiritual funny bone, and every now and again the Word of God should hit that, and you go, oh, why did he say that? Because I love you, and because God loves you, and the Word of God is true, and that's what I'm going to preach. I don't know what else to do. I'd be afraid to do anything else. How's that? Well, there's so many examples. The Spartans, when they were big and in, in, in ruling the world. There were little towns that had heard they were coming and heard they were coming and heard they were coming. And of course, the day one you hear they're coming, everybody grabs their swords or shields or spears. Everybody goes out, they prepare for war. They didn't show up, and the next day they didn't show up. And a week goes by, they don't show up. A month goes by, they don't show up. Pretty soon, somebody starts blowing a trumpet, and nobody's grabbing their weapons. And here come the Spartans. They weren't stupid. <clears throat> Well, I'm blowing a trumpet, and I'm telling you Jesus is coming. And I may be telling you this in, in 10 years, and I may not be able to say it again tomorrow. See, I don't know. All I know is this, is when he gets here, he is going to hold me accountable for what I've said from behind this place right here, from the people that he's placed in my care. And as a shepherd, I cannot do anything but say, folks, sometimes the wolf is coming we need to be prepared. We need to look. We need to see. How many of you like to get woke up in the middle of the night, somebody screaming in your face, fire, fire? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Know, how's that? If they don't love you and they sneak out of bed and they go out, you know, you're in trouble. <laughs> Some years ago, myself and my wife, we, we were at a, a decently upscale hotel. It's the middle of the night, and the fire alarms went off. That's a big place. Now, you can't use the elevator. They shut the elevator down when the fire alarms go off, so you've got to use the stairs. And if you're up way up there somewhere, it's a while trying to get down. The nice thing was on different levels, you could go across to a parking garage. So you didn't have to go clear down to the ground floor. So we went here, went there. We're running all over the place, and it was aggravating. And you start to think about it, and exactly that. What would happen if the fire alarm did go off? What would happen to the people that rolled over and says, ah, it's probably not that big a deal, and they just stayed in the bed? What happens? What happens? I seriously believe, and, and nobody agrees with me much, but I think on a few tombstones, we ought to have something written, died as stupid. <laughs> on the old tombstones, they used to have, they used to put down there, uh, uh, you know, died of tuberculosis or, or died of, of fever, died of this. And they used to have on some of the old real flat soapstone tombstones. And I think a few of them ought to say died of stupid. The alarm was there. They heard it. And they did not prepare themselves. And I wonder how many people that go to church all the time are still going to have their feet on the ground after that great trumpet sounds. And they're going to be right here because of stupid. Because you've got the word, you've got preachers, you've got church, you've got everything else saying we need to be preparing ourselves. Ah, and yet here we stand. Here we stand. I hope none of you know anybody personally, but every now and again we'll get a preacher that wants to stand up and he wants to say on whatever. July the 2nd, and give you a year and everything else, that's when Jesus is coming. And then when Jesus doesn't show up on that day, most of Christianity looks foolish, and, and the world says, see, I told you, and we go on, we go on, we go on. And I think we know enough of the Word of God that we do not know the time, the day. We know the seasons. We know what's going on around us. We've got signs that are pointing the way. But, but anybody starts picking a day, just walk away. Let it go. Let it go. I, I told him in a minister's conference once, I said, if we could get 365 of us to pick a day apiece, I said, so many years, one of us has got to be right. <laughs> one of, one of, I mean, sometime we got to hit it. But the fact is, we don't know. So what do we do if you don't know? You prepare. You prepare. You make yourself ready. <clears throat> Honestly, I often wondered why people would get mad at me if I said we needed to repent, we need to turn from our wicked ways, we need to get on our knees before God. But why, why do people get mad at me? Because we want to do what we want to do, that's why. We want to do it our way. We want to, and let me let you in on a secret. This is a guy that's done in his way. 
So many people tell me I got this and this and this and I got to give up if I start going to church. Let me tell you what, anything I gave up was killing me, both physically and spiritually. Let me say that again. Anything that I was doing when I was out here was killing me physically and spiritually. Everything that I have found in Jesus Christ is life, both in this life and in the one to come. And I can't tell it to you any better way. Anything that I have walked away from and everything that I have walked to has given me life. Amen. And there is life in Jesus Christ. Yes. The Bible makes it clear that we are responsible for how we respond to the warnings. <clears throat> Myself and my wife pulled up to a red light in the middle of all that storm the other day, and it was out. There was nothing there. Raining sideways, couldn't see. What's the law concerning that? Where we stop? How did you know that? Somebody taught it to you. Now, if most of us think about it, we don't know when they taught it to us. I can't remember exactly. Maybe driver's ed. I don't remember. Somebody taught me that when the light was out, it's a four-way stop. It's in the book. It's in the book. <laughs> okay, there's another good one. So, we got a book full of warnings here. <laughs> We got laws here. We got things here. Now, now, what I didn't see until we started to go through it, I pulled up. Another guy pulled up at the same time. I was making the left. He was going straight through. Who has the right of way? He does. He does. Going straight through. How do we know that? Somebody taught him to it. So I sat there. And the guy came straight through. He was waiting on me. I was waiting on him. We sort of looked. And, and uh, I saw he was moving, so I'm letting him go through. He had the right of way. I made my left and went back. Guess who was sitting right there in the intersection? I didn't see him until I was going through. It was a police officer. Somebody there to enforce the law of that right there. Now I'm going to take you back a few years. I was going through town, and I'm, I'm coming up to Parkman Road and Market Street. You can't see down Parkman Road, and the light was out. And I pulled up, and I stopped. And I started to go through, and a guy in a 15-passenger Dodge van comes straight through that intersection at about 50 miles an hour. Ooh. He drove up completely through the parking lot of Arby's that is there, bounced up over the concrete things, bent the rim on his van and everything else. Had he not done that, he would have killed me. He'd hit me broadside. I was dead. I had no chance. He never touched his brakes. Now, did he not know the law? Didn't he hear? Did he figure my vehicle's bigger than everybody else's? They all got away. What was it that caused him to do that? I don't know. But it almost cost me my life. So now when I come up, guess what? I'll sit and wait on you. <laughs> you can go on. I got enough warning. But see, somebody taught it to us. Somebody. So here we are. We got the word of God. You, you, you've got radio, TV. We can be inundated with the word if we want to be. Don't listen to all of it. Some of it's junk. But a lot of it's really good stuff. And we can be inundated with the word if we want to be. But we got to heed the warnings. And we got to know what it says. Now again, I can't tell you the person that taught me that when the light's out, that's a four we stop. I don't remember. I do know that somebody did because I know it. And if you knew it, somebody taught it to you. And they handed it down, they handed it down. I watch people, you ever see people coming down the, the, the road 70 miles an hour and they come off the ramp at 35? That's not a ramp, that's called an acceleration lane. I'm gonna teach drivers at this lane. That's an acceleration lane. When you come off of there, when you hit the bottom, you should be able to merge into traffic at road speed, not 35 miles an hour. Okay, if you're in that lane, and you see them coming, courtesy, put your blinker on, change lanes, let them come in. But yet we act like we own that piece of road. We do pay our taxes, you know. That's fine. <laughs> see, it's common sense. But see, the reason that we know this stuff is because somebody else taught it to us. Somebody else showed it to us. Somebody else gave us the information. And the information that we have this morning comes from the Word of God. Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. Don't wait till it's too late. Don't wait till, till it's too sad. 
Too many people want to blame God. The one lady that couldn't breathe. I don't know why God done this to me. Too many people want to blame their parents. Both my parents smoked. I didn't have any choice. Too many people want to blame the government. Well, if the government would have told me, they want to blame, blame society. I smoked for a while. You know how why I started smoking? Let me tell you how dumb I am. I'll, I'll throw some good stuff at you, show you I'm not that bright. I was standing in a place that I had no business being. And a friend of mine handed me a cigarette. I stuck it in my mouth. And a beautiful young lady came up and put her hand on my shoulder. And she said, dude, you look cool. <laughs> I am dead serious. And I lit it up and about choked to death. But because <laughs> she said I looked good, I was willing to kill myself. <laughs> and every time I saw her, I fired one up because I look good. So, so what does this say about us? It says we're more concerned about some areas of our life than we are others, and we need to be more concerned about the spiritual side of us than anything else. Than anything else. The Bible makes it clear that we need this. I can go back and I can say my teachers never taught me. Being honest, pushing 67. I had some teachers when I went to school that had no business teaching. How about you? I had a bunch of them were some of the greatest people that walked the face of the earth. And they were smart. They knew how to use me. They knew how to get the potential out of me. I think about some of the things that I've done for them. Why? Because they asked me. They treated me halfway decent. They liked me. They looked me in the face tell me I had to do something. You were done. That was me. You were done. You weren't getting anything out of me. I went to school and went to church because my dad was bigger than me. How's that? But the idea is, I went. So how do we overcome the negative things of our life? We get the positive parts of the Word of God. We begin to apply them to our life. We begin to lay them down so that block upon block, foundation upon foundation, we begin to build the house in us that Christ is looking for. It doesn't just pop up all vinyl sided with a picket fence. It comes up a piece at a time as we learn. We're supposed to stop at a four way stop. That way that we learn, move over and let people merge in. See, we, we know how traffic's supposed to work. We should learn how our spiritual lives are supposed to work and how we're supposed to grow in the things of God. So this morning, don't ignore the warnings. <laughs> Hello. So don't ignore the warnings. Don't ignore all of that stuff that we have. What we have to do instead of ignoring is to learn to heed. But here we are. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. Here's, here's a question. I'm all done. Choose you this day whom you will serve. <clears throat> Who said that? Joshua. guy named Joshua. Oh, man, see, there you go. Some of you guys read the book. And he was an old and dying man. Choose you this day whom you will serve. The gods that your father served on the other side? Ask for me and miles. How many of you got that on your refrigerator? My wife sticks her hand up. I don't even know what we got on our refrigerator. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So if you know it, let's walk in it. I thank God for his word this morning. I mean, going through this, I was up late last night, right, and rewriting and everything else, and I thought, you know what? Let the Lord say what the Lord needs to say. And we'll go with it. We'll go with it. See, see God knows what he's doing when I don't. Oh, let me say that one again. God knows what he's doing when I don't. He knows how to fix it. He knows how to work it. Let's leave it in his hands. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. Father, I thank you for warnings. Father, like when we were kids, we used to play a game. The warning this morning is ready or not. Here I come. 
Father, I pray that we are ready. I pray that we heed the warnings. I pray that when the siren goes off, we know what it means. And when the great, great trumpet sounds, Father, we are prepared for it. Father, so many people have been saved and so many people have lost their lives by heeding or not heeding a warning. Or this is a spiritual thing, not a physical one, and that makes it more important than the other. I ask that you would touch our hearts and our lives. I ask that you would uplift us with your right hand. I ask, Lord, that you would instill in us a desire to be ready. And Father, not us only, but for all of those that we would speak to. And I give you glory, I give you honor, and I give you praise. And in your precious name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.